Hello, everyone, and welcome to the talk titled Life Without Sidecars. It's eBPF's promise too good to be true. So today I'm going to try to <clears throat> present my opinion on why the sidecar model is here to stay and why it is, in fact, the future of the service mesh. So first of all, who am I? My name is Zahari Dichev, and I work for Voyant, the creators of Linkerd. And if you want to reach out and ask me questions or connect, you can use any of these channels. So the agenda of this talk uh, is quite packed. I hope we have enough time to cover everything. First of all, we are going to focus on like what, what is a service mesh and why you might need one. We're going to look at the three main pieces of functionality that a service mesh provides. Then we're going to take a look at what Linkerd is. We're going to also explore uh, and give a bit of an overview of eBPF, and in particular how it relates to cloud native networking. And then we're going to ask ourselves the question of whether eBPF can actually replace the sidecar in a service mesh. And we are also going to evaluate a couple of other models that are uh, being used in production. So again, like I tend to think of service meshes with respect to three main uh, pieces of functionality that you get when you adopt one. First of all, you have observability. And this is something that you want in a distributed system because you really want to know what's happening in your services. Um, so that gives you, service meshes gives you uh, golden metrics uh, across all of your services. So things like HTTP and TCP level metrics, uh, request sampling, and all of that. Uh, on the reliability front, you get uh, retries, circuit breaking, automatic canary deployments based on you know, success rates of your new rollout, and all of these nice things to um, keep your systems running reliably. On the security front, you get automatic MTLS in, MTLS in most cases across mesh workloads. Um, <clears throat> and you get network traffic policies that, are, that can express very rich uh, network rules on the layer seven uh, protocol stack. And Linkerd is just, uh, it, it's a service mesh that uh, it's very simple to use, and it comes with very sensible defaults in order to get you up and running as quickly as possible and get you to production in a relatively short amount of time. It uses a purpose-built microproxy that's been specifically designed to run as a sidecar. It is also a CNCF graduated project that uh, benefits from a thriving open source community, and you can convince yourself of that uh, by joining our Slack or you know, checking out our open issues on the GitHub page. So really the high level architecture of, for the most part, all service meshes, right? Um, and Linkerd in particular, consists of two main components. One is the control plane, which is a set of services that runs in your cluster. That's re responsible for serving TLS certificates to the proxy, for service discovery, um, facilitating the identity aware policy, and just providing all of these uh, rules to the proxies so they can, so they can work uh, with your services. And then you have the proxy or the data plane, which with the sidecar model, it's injected in each one of your mesh workloads. And in most of the cases, this proxy is a transparent one. Um, that provides you things like metrics exports, so you can scrape these proxies and get the metrics into your observability pipeline. There is latency aware load balancing happening at the proxy level, and the proxies are where automatic MTLS is implemented and TLS termination. And in Linkerd, for example, you have other nice things like on-demand diagnostic API that allows you to tap and observe the requests that are flowing through uh, a particular proxy. So if we want to kind of express all of that in a diagrammatic fashion, the life of a request through meshed workloads looks a bit like this. 
um, you, each pod is injected with a proxy and an init container. So the init container is responsible for actually setting up your IP table rules. So all incoming and outgoing traffic goes through the proxy. So when a request originates in your application container, it's intercepted by the proxy. The proxy then uh, would most of the times parse the protocol, provide application uh, like protocol aware metrics. It will use its TLS certificate to establish, uh, to do a handshake with the proxy on the other side and establish a TLS session that um, ensures that both peers know who they're talking to and that they're talking to who they're supposed to. And then the data that's flowing through this connection is encrypted. So when you know, the, re the request arrives at the other side, the proxy terminates the terminates uh, TLS there and forwards all the data to your application container. So that's how, uh, that's how the sidecar model uh, in a service mesh works at the moment. So now let's turn our site towards eBPF and kind of look what this promising technology is giving us and see whether it can allow us to, you know, improve this sidecar model and and just generally benefit from this new technology that's been quite hot in the cloud native networking space. So eBPF uh, has been compared to JavaScript for the kernel. And it is essentially an interface to make the kernel programmable. So it is an event-driven programming model that allows you to run custom codes in kernel space. And that allows you to be incredibly efficient in certain situations. It allows developers to avoid costly data transfers between user space and kernel space and you know, minimize context switches, syscall latency and cost, and just overall allows you to eliminate a lot of the costs that you get in certain scenarios. And it is also safe because the programs that could be written and run in the kernel are very, well, fairly limited in nature. So each program needs to go through a quite stringent verifier in order to prove that the program is safe to be executed in the kernel. And that is a good thing to have, albeit a bit limiting. So really, where could that, you know, where could that, where could all of that be useful? in a networking context. Well, take for example, a traditional reverse proxy, right? Most of the times, what happens is that um, a request rarely goes directly from the client to the server. Most of the times what ends up happening is that there is a load balancer or a firewall sitting in between and the request needs to go through that. So in a typical proxy or a load balancer, what's en what ends up happening is that the request goes to your socket through the kernel level and then the data is copied to, um, to user space where certain logic is run that decides whether this request should be rejected or where it should be routed to. And when that happens, then the request is copied back to kernel space and it travels to its destination. Now, that is fairly inefficient because again, you end up paying uh, cost for for executing system calls, you're paying costs for transferring data between kernel and user space. And how could eBPF help with that? Well, there are implementations of proxies out there that um, effectively use eBPF to do all of this decision making in kernel space and allow you to avoid all of these cost, costly transfers and like the intermediary step of like going to user space. And this has been incredibly successful in certain scenarios and there are you know, applications that are benefiting from, from this use case quite heavily. So it's, it's actually great. And you know, if we, so now we have this programming model that you know, can run in the kernel and we need to ask ourselves, you know, could we use that to our advantage in order to make the sidecar go away, right? I mean, after all, 
That's why we're here for, right? To get rid of the sidecar. Nobody wants it. So really, we need to ask ourselves the, this question. But before that, let's think about some of the limitations that are inherent to eBPF, to the eBPF programming model for a good reason. First of all, um, eBPF programs are not allowed to block. So you can't really like, just wait on an arbitrary condition to be either true or false for an undefined amount of time and proceed after that. Like, there are no unbounded loops. Uh, they are limited in size, and the verifier needs to be able to evaluate all paths of execution up front. So on top of that, there is very limited state management. So you can't really have arbitrary blobs of data living in the kernel. So with all of that being said, that renders some of the things that a modern service mesh is supposed to be quite hard to actually implement in eBPF. So things like MTLS handshakes, you know, um, things like retries, timeouts, circuit breaking, these are all hard things because you need to have a lot of complicated state management that's happening. And at that point in time, it's fairly hard to do that in, in kernel space. And you know, any layer seven protocol parsing, albeit possible, it's, it like brings the question of whether that's the right place to do it. And of course, even if you can, like, there is a challenge that comes with debugging uh, and troubleshooting applications uh, that, uh, that are eBPS. So you don't really benefit from like, the rich tool chain that you get with other higher level programming languages. So really now, let's take a look at three particular features that a modern service mesh provides and think about like, what would it take to actually implement that in eBPF? Is it possible? And even if it was, does it actually make sense? So first of, first of all, let's take a look at latency aware load balancing. The way that's achieved in Linkerd is that each proxy, each proxy effectively is talking to a destination service and this destination service knows about the endpoints um, of all of your network targets on your cluster. So the proxy then maintains a set of these endpoints internally. And it's only natural that you know, some endpoints will exhibit very low latency, while others will exhibit uh, higher latency. And the load balancer then internally takes note of that and runs an algorithm that results in more requests being sent to faster endpoints and vice versa. And, you know, if you really think about it, like, doing that in eBPF would be quite complicated. There is quite a lot of states that's need, that you need to account for in order to do that. And nowadays, implementing such an algorithm purely in kernel space is, you know, fairly hard to do. You just don't, like, just doesn't fit in the programming model that eBPF is using. Then let's turn our sights to something that's actually quite uh, welcomed by a lot of the users of service mesh, service meshes, and that's identity-based policy. And really what that is, the way that works uh, most of the times is that when a proxy fires up, it generates a private key and it sends a certificate signing request to an identity service that in turn issues a certificate back to the proxy. Now this certificate, the proxy uses this certificate to establish TLS sessions with other proxies. So that way you get authentication and encryption on your connection. So both peers know who they're talking to, and this cer the certificates of both peers are tied to the identity of the workload. On top of that, the proxies also communicate with a policy service that <clears throat> allows them to, uh, to enforce very rich layer seven policies around um, what requests go where and what is allowed. And that's how you get authorization. So a typical identity-based authorization policy will sort of 
look like this, right? So you can see that you can define very rich protocol aware uh, policies on that level. So you can do things like define policies where you say, well, workloads that are from this service account uh, can talk only to a set of other workloads from this set of service accounts uh, on this port on this particular uh, HTTP road. So really, we're talking about layer seven policy that needs to know about the HTTP protocol. Needs to, you know, this logic needs to parse the protocol. I mean, even like doing the TLS handshake itself in eBPF is quite complicated because there is so much happening under the hood. It's like version negotiation and all of that. It's just a very hard thing to do at the moment. Um, given the limitation that eBPF has. And not only that, um, on top of that, there, are other f there is other functionality that is quite hard. And my favorite is retries. And retries are actually um, something that, you know, people oftentimes underestimate how hard it actually is to implement that. So really think about what happens when a proxy or any system needs to, do, needs to be able to retry requests. First of all, a request comes from your application container, goes through the proxy. And this proxy now fires the request to the server. It could very well be the case that the server, this request actually fails. Yeah? So now you want to retract. Right. This request is retriable. What, well, think about what needs to happen under the hood. Right? Like, you actually have to have buffered that request until you know whether it has succeeded or not. And when you know, you can potentially retry this request. So really, you have some condition, that being the request succeeding or not, that you don't know how much time that's going to that's going to take to, you know, um, have an answer to. And then you also have some arbitrary chunk of data that you need to buffer somewhere. And you also possibly don't know what the size of this data is, because there are streaming requests, chunk encoding, and whatnot. So, you know, you need to kind of think about all of these things and determine whether this could actually be implemented in eBPF, where you have so many um, requirements that um, are there to keep the kernel running, right? Like, this is simply a programming problem that is not very well suited for the model that eBPF follows. So, but don't get me wrong, like, we at Buoyant and I in general, like, I, we really like eBPF. We think that it's a very promising technology that uh, has quite a lot of benefits to it and has its place. So, you know, for example, you can do a lot of nice things that, that people are doing out there very successfully. So things like dynamic IP routing at layer, layer four and layer three, packet filtering, very fast firewalls. Um, you can use CBPF for traffic monitoring, uh, for application profiling and, and, you know, debugging. They are very interesting tools out there that do this sort of stuff. But anything that's layer seven and requires complicated state management is just not really, not really fit for this uh, particular programming model. And there, there are solutions out there and service meshes that uh, are you know, marketing the fact that they are using KBPF under the hood. But as a matter of fact, if you look closely, you understand that in fact, there is a proxy somewhere. It might not be a sidecar, but there is a proxy. And all of these higher level, uh, all of these things that are higher on the network stack, they end up happening in the proxy. So I'd say that it's, it's sufficient to say that, you know, for now, um, we, we really need, a service mesh needs a proxy. Like, it's just a matter of where that proxy is going to live. So, you know, thinking about that, um, that prompts the question, can we do something better? Right? Like, can this proxy live somewhere else where it takes less resources and just makes our lives a lot easier? Well, let's see. So, first of all, 
there is this model of a shared proxy per node. And that's uh, something that's, again, used by some solutions. And effectively, what this means is that you have a single proxy per node, and all of your pods that are on this particular node are sharing this proxy. And you only like talk proxy to proxy when you're crossing node boundaries. So this you know, has some advantages, but you also need to be aware of its, the limitations of this model. So this is, this is arguably more efficient if you use a resource-hungry proxy. So if you're using a, like a general purpose proxy, such as Envoy, maybe you know, this model is better. Maybe like sticking a proxy in every pod of yours is not the best way forward. But all of this comes with a number of disadvantages, right? So first of all, you have problems around resource starvation and fairness. So really, if you adopt if this model is, uh, if you adopt this model, you need to be aware of the fact that you might end up in a situation where on a single node, there is, for example, a pod that uses a lot of the resources of this proxy and effectively starves the other pods out of resources. So you end up with this noisy neighbor problems that you, know, you can't really deterministically account for because you're at the mercy of the Kubernetes scheduler. Then, uh, there is the problem of lacking any um, good means to do resource optimization. And the reason for that is that if you, because if you're adopting this model, you're effectively losing the ability to optimize resource consumptions at, um, at the pot level. And this is, how, this is how Kubernetes has been actually designed to work, right? Like, um, so what ends up happening is that you, uh, your proxy that's on a node will need resources according to the pods that are scheduled on this particular node. So you can't really, you can't really deterministically reason about putting some constraints on the resources that this proxy consumes because, again, the set of workloads that are the set of pods that are running on this node is effectively ever changing. You know, this proxy might need a certain amount of resources now, but tomorrow the Kubernetes scheduler might decide that, you know, well, I'm going to put some other pods on this node, and now the resource consumption characteristics of this proxy all of a sudden change. So you can't really reason very well about all of that. On top of that, there is no real isolation of secret material. So, you know, you end up uh, holding all of the private keys and certificates uh, for all of the pods that are on this node in this proxy. So if there is a breach or a bug and there is like a leak of, you know, and there is a leak of uh, private key material, then effectively all of your pods that are on this node are compromised. And then what scares me the most is actually the increased blast radius, right? So the problem there is that if this proxy goes down, now a bunch of pods that are on this node are affected. And again, you don't really have the means to reason about like what are, what are these pods at any given time. So this makes things like operability quite hard because it seems quite scary to upgrade such a proxy. Then there is another model that I've seen being used, and this is the shared proxy per service account. And that um, is sort of similar. You're effectively sharing a proxy per single service account. And that makes sense uh, to me on the security front. So there is, so, so you know you end up solving the problem of security um, a little bit better, but again, um, and, and there is arguably a little bit more um, improved resource utilization because you could argue that um, pods that are part of the same service account are effectively uh, are likely to are likely to exhibit um, similar resource consumption characteristics. But again, this presents again increased operational risk, and it 
just doesn't bring a lot more advantages because it makes deployment hard. You're again dealing with multi-tenancy. You're dealing with unpredictability of like what pods are actually um, using this particular proxy at any given time. As opposed to that, I think that the sidecar model has a number of advantages that um, you know that that you can benefit from. First of all, resource consumption scales with the application, right? So really, you know, uh, the more resources your application consumes, the more the more uh, resources a proxy is going to, to be consuming. And you know, you can you, you have a lot of more facilities to optimize the resource consumption of the proxy and reason about like what limits and constraints you're going to put on, on this particular proxy. Failure is limited uh, to a particular instance. So when something fails and the proxy goes down, like all of the native Kubernetes concepts kick in and all of the facilities like rescheduling, eviction, OEMs, this all works in your favor to alleviate the situation. And you know what actually failed. And that makes maintenance and upgrades a lot easier because you effectively just end up like roll out or starting your applications and you benefit from like the deployment model of uh, Kubernetes in order to also maintain the proxy. And on top of that, the security boundary is very clear. Everything is contained within the pod, which is the smallest logical unit in Kubernetes. So all of that being said, I keep hearing um, a number of statements around this model that I would label as popular folklore. First of all, I hear a lot that sidecars waste resources. I don't think that's the case. First of all, not all sidecars are created equal. You know, Linkerd's proxy has been optimized to specifically work as a sidecar, and it's incredibly, it has incredibly small footprint. Um, on top of that, I also hear that sidecars introduce extra latency. The fact is that the latency that's introduced by sidecars is negligible compared to the latency that uh, most of the applications exhibit. And if that stops you from using a sidecar, maybe you know the service, the microservices model is not entirely right for you. I also hear that the service mesh will soon live in the kernel because everything is moving into this layer. As we saw, the kernel programming model has quite a lot of limitations and that render you know, implementing a lot of the things that you would use a service mesh for, you know, very hard, if not impossible. And then I also hear that multi-tenant proxies are the way forward. But as we saw, they are hard to operate. Uh, they have a number of concerns around security and uh, st stability. And, you know, it's just, uh, they don't, they kind of go against the grain of, what the Kubernetes and container uh, computing model is, uh, according to my opinion. So really, in conclusion, I'm going to say that um, I think eBPF brings a number of advantages that could be very useful in the cloud native networking space. And we should push and explore this uh, avenue a lot more. I think it has a lot to offer. I will also say that, you know, unlike some companies that are starting with the multi-tenant proxy as a model, you know, we've already actually been there. Linkerd one was running a multi-tenant proxy and there were a lot of users in production and we saw firsthand all the operational problems that they were experiencing and that's why I decided we need to move away from this model and we firmly believe that uh, sidecars are here to stay and they, in fact, are the right model for the service mesh. So thank you for listening. And now I guess we have some time for Q&A, if we have time. Right. So the question was whether I've thought about things like confidential containers because the sidecar model doesn't really, you know, work very well with um, with um, kind of trusted environments. And the reason is, uh, uh, the truth is, I have actually not looked into that, and that'd be an interesting thing to explore. But no, I 
I don't really have a lot of experience and much to say about that. Hello, hello. A question over here on the right. Oh, here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I'm wondering how many people here use Istio or uh, Cilium, but it seems the what you're arguing against is that the Envoy proxy is very heavy-handed. Does solutions have to be worked around not using sidecars? Um, can't other projects use the Linkerd proxy um, because it's really lightweight instead of trying to work around uh, sidecars as a saying sidecars are a problem? I see. Uh, well, I, I mean, like, we, we, I, I'm not here to advertise Linkerd or its proxy. Um, this was just an objective, you know, evaluation of the state of things. But I would say that Linkerd's proxy is lightweight, and it's also open source. Anyone can go and see how it's been implemented, the performance um, optimizations we've done. And if they want to experiment with running it in their service mesh, yeah, sure, that's, that's great. Like, more adoption is always great. So probably it's a good idea to try that. If performance and resource consumption is what bothers you with the sidecar model. Uh, uh, OK, and thanks for presentation. So uh, my question will be like that. Um, so now uh, the Linkerd, if we use a CNI mode or init container, it uh, basically creates like a chain of IP tables rules, yes? Uh, have you observed any issues related to that? I mean, IP tables, yes, as it, as it is, it's kind of on some modes of running Kubernetes clusters, it can introduce some delays on updating, yes? So have you observed on some large deployments the, with the current situation? Because you produce basically six IP table rules, rules per each sidecar. So, yeah, your opinion on it, so to say. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we've seen, yes, we've seen problems with using IP tables, um, especially on like larger clusters. And we're, you know, actively looking at other options to in order to alleviate these problems. But at the moment, we, we have not really, we have not really, we, we aren't really focused on that. But yeah, I'm aware that there are problems. Well, if that's all the questions, thanks everyone for attending and enjoy Amsterdam. <laughs>